Well, the Washington Post is calling it the Afghanistan Papers. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, through a Freedom of Information Act request, the Washington Post was able to get a hold of some uh, transcripts and notes from 400 interviews that effectively appear to be the uh, U.S. military and government debriefing itself on the 18-year war in Afghanistan from the George Bush administration through Barack Obama through Donald Trump. And the conclusions, as trumpeted uh, by the Washington Post, were that the military and politicians were putting a rosy uh, picture out to the public, a, a picture they knew to be false about the progress we were making in Afghanistan, and they were essentially hiding unmistakable evidence that the war was unwinnable. Now, I listened to an interview with uh, Douglas Lute, who was the White House uh, Afghan war czar, so to speak, a three-star general. And he said, uh, even though he had very critical things uh, to say uh, in the course of his interviews and these notes that have been released, he said that at no time did he know of any military or political official who was intentionally saying things that they knew to be wrong um, just to make things look good. But uh, Bill, you know, this the reason why they're calling this the Afghanistan Papers is because generation or two ago, we had the Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers, yeah. And uh, this, as we, uh, as we go through an impeachment process and we're coming out of the whole Mueller probe process, and it just seems, Bill, like we're mired back in the late 1960s, early 1970s when it comes to government uh, accountability and transparency. Government accountability and transparency are just byproducts of this process. And the process is the ongoing destruction of everything that, that America could possibly stand for and the utter, utter determination to uh, splatter mud over anything that may look anything less than murderous. So first question I have is where does the Washington Post get off saying that a war is unwinnable? What on the Washington Post staff, who on the Washington Post staff has determined that a war was unwinnable? Well, they're, it's an interesting going, they're paraphrasing the, uh, the notes and the interviews that were done as part of this whole debriefing and learning process. Um, and these are very frank conversations that these people are having. In fact, uh, General uh, Loot uh, specifically said, look, we were speaking very bluntly and very directly about things we saw. For example, Loot himself said after all those years in Afghanistan, he really didn't feel like the U.S. government had a way to learn about Afghanistan that would produce helpful strategic initiatives and that we had over relied on military efforts and under relied on things like diplomacy and other kinds of tools in the toolbox. And so the, I, the Washington Post basically is not trying to characterize this other than saying, yes, this are. is what the insider interviews said about it, that we, we knew it wasn't winnable and yet we continued to soldier on. If a general or a number of generals, because one general is one general in an 18-year war, that doesn't particularly mean anything, for the, for, the, for the Washington Post conclusion to be accurate, you would have had to have a number of highly placed American citizens, uh, leaders say, this war is unwinnable. Because the things that you were talking about are, are, are tactical issues, they're issues that can be addressed, they're issues that can be improved upon, and so on. But what you're saying, or what the, po what the Times, uh, the uh, Washington Post is saying, is that they knew the war was unwinnable, but they kept on going with it anyway. And I find that term to be a very, very interesting term coming from someplace like the, the Washington Post. I really don't think that the Washington Post has any idea about what a winnable war is. As far as they're concerned, I know they think that everything's unwinnable. Everything we do is unwinnable. There's nothing we can touch that is possible possibly going to be even acceptable, let alone winnable. Well, Bill, so my I, once point, again, I don't so think that the journalists at the Washington Post are looking at this and saying, now, based on what we read, we think the war is unwinnable. They're saying things like, most of these people who were interviewed in, within the government. So this is information that they got from a freedom of information. That they're not, not interviewing these people. They're reading notes from interviews. And it says, U.S. officials acknowledged in these interviews that their war fighting strategies were fatally flawed and that Washington wasted enormous sums of money trying to remake Afghanistan into a modern nation. The government had botched attempts to curtail runaway corruption, to build a competent Afghan army and police force, and to try to put a dent into Afghanistan's thriving opium trade. All of this 
basically they're saying these people who were on the inside are saying we continued to plow ahead knowing that we hadn't learned enough to be able to figure out how to solve these things. Yes, and that's not the same as saying that the thing is unwinnable. And the reason I'm going to such trouble over this over this particular word is because I watched the Vietnam War get called unwinnable. And, and, and immediately after the biggest catastrophe for the North Vietnamese and the communists, Walter Cronkite comes out and says the war is unwinnable, like Walter Cronkite is some kind of kind of strategic genius and has got all this stuff figured out. That term has a very, very, very loud kind of a, of a, a button click attached to it as far as I'm concerned. And the fact that they use language like that already tells me that they've got a political angle on this story. Now let's get down to the actual story, because the conclusion from the story, I think, is just plain Pay, just it's just obvious where these people are going with this thing. So now let's get down to the actual issue. It is in the interest of the United States that the military not only criticize itself, but criticize itself harshly and thoroughly. If it turns out that these mistakes happen, and I'm sure they did, then we had better learn something from these mistakes or else we're going to have to make them again. And that's how it works. That's how it's always worked. So to the degree the top commanders are saying, look, we knew that we had to do this, 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 and this, and it never happened. And no matter how much time we said, how many times we said it has to happen, it still never happened. The lesson that we should take from that is that military possibilities are not the same as political possibilities. And that ought to be something that we keep uh, under our hat the next time we have to make a decision like this. The the idea that 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 people would would throw away a victory in order to be proven right is beyond my personal ability. But I've seen it twice now. I've seen it twice in my life. I saw it after Vietnam and I saw it after Iraq. And and you could have made the same arguments about Iraq. I'm not look. I'm not I'm not defending the position in Afghanistan. I'll get to that in a second. But what I am what I am really uh, up about is is this. Is this perception and this uh, promotion of this idea on the part of the press? It is absolutely true that in the first couple of years of, of Iraq that we were really suffering and we were we were flailing around. We made some terrible mistakes. And then along comes David Petraeus and this plan for the surge. And he said, go big or go home. And so George Bush decided to go big. And when he left office, there hadn't been a single American casualty there in six months. So you would think that given that chance to have a, an actual victory there, you'd think that the country's interest would come ahead of party politics, but it doesn't. And so they sold that out and they and they couldn't form a single simple status of forces agreement. And so out we go, which is what they wanted, win or lose. And so the next thing you know, that country goes to hell. That is precisely exactly what happened in, the, in 1974 when the Congress basically cut off a... Uh, an ally in a, in, in a situation that had been bloody, horrible, and 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 heartbreaking, but they simply snatched the the defeat out of the jaws of, of the victory, or at least out of the stalemate. So I am I am deeply concerned if military leaders are telling me that political leaders are not able to comprehend what needs to be done. If that turns out to be the case, because that was certainly the case in Vietnam as well, there were any number of people who said, this is a war we can win and we can do it like this. And they said, no, it can't be done. Craig well, it Abrams seems had, in this case, Bill, that they're actually saying that military leaders are telling military leaders that we couldn't comprehend what needed to be done. It, it wasn't necessarily the nexus of politics and the military. And in fact, uh, you know, where they were effective in things like a surge of, of troops, um, it, that effectiveness lasted only as long as we could keep the troops there. Once we had to pull the troops out, because we never really were able to grasp the context of Afghanistan or, in frankly, tell the good guys from the bad guys in many cases, um, it was really hard to sustain any initiative. And in effect, Afghanistan, I mean, this, I'm, I'm now I'm reading into this a little bit, but Afghanistan uh, could not be brought into the 21st century uh, the way we thought they could, but we kept trying to do it and we thought we were making progress, or in some cases, politicians and military officials knew we weren't making progress, but wanted to bring forth the best possible picture of it. First of all, 
this we'd have to keep the troops there forever argument is not one that I particularly subscribe to, having had NATO forces in Europe now for 75 years. 75 years after, after the surrender of Nazi Germany, we still have large numbers of American troops to protect Europe from the Germans and now also from the Russians. So I'm not, I'm not buying that. Same thing for Korea, just five years less. So we've been there for six decades and so, continue so to So what you're not work. buying is so, the need that we have to get these people out of there. No, no. What, that's not what I'm saying. What, saying. what I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is, is that this conclusion, that this is unwinnable, is not what is indicated in this report to me. For example, you say that the generals repeatedly said that we should have done more about corruption. We should have gone after corruption more. Just take that as one example, right? Okay. So that is a problem that can be solved. And and so what they're saying is, is that is that whatever whatever suggestions they made didn't get uh, pushed uphill enough to the point where the politicians would act on it. And they're also saying that we didn't have any idea really of what it was going to take to go in there and 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 come up with some kind of victory. And I'll tell you what victory in Afghanistan looks like. Just give me one second. The the underlying assumption is what is what really, really bothers me. And the and and furthermore, what bothers me is this idea that something is unwinnable. Now, for those of you who think I'm just this war hawk who's just determined to go into war everywhere I can, let me tell you what winnable means to me. You can search for online, it is a brochure. It's a it's a it's a airline brochure. I think it's from about 1957, somewhere in there. And it is an airline brochure for um Kabul. And you see these modern women walking down the street and you see all these beautiful architecture and all this other stuff. What people don't realize about Afghanistan is that Afghanistan actually did work for a while there. It actually did. Same for Baghdad. It was working pretty well. Now, whether or not that's a burden we want to carry or whether it's a burden we can even lift, that's a different argument. But there is, in fact, evidence that this, that this society, which was once functioning on some kind of level, is certainly no longer functioning, but that doesn't mean it couldn't function again. And this is all I'm really trying to say. Look, the I have been an enormous uh, critic of of this half half in and half out thing. Once once I realized that the that the Iraqi Constitution was going to be based around Sharia, it's like saying it's like saying after um, after Japan's defeat. That um, that the military would rule the, um, the the country. That the Japanese military cliques would rule the country after after uh, the American victory. It's like what wh what are you what are you doing? What what is this? What's going on? So, in there is no question, obviously, that the entire premise of it has been faulty from the point where Al Qaeda was no longer operating out of Afghanistan, um, and. With that said, the reason that this thing started in the first place was to make sure that Al Qaeda wouldn't be operating in Afghanistan, and they're not, because they don't exist anymore, because most of them are dead and buried in the sands of Iraq. But that's a different story. So, at what point do you declare victory and get out of this thing? You know, and it makes me wonder if the if the institutional inertia. What what interests me is in the interest of the United States and in the interest of of protecting our troops in the future and and our national interests. What lessons can we learn from this? And if the lesson is don't go there in the first place, that's one thing. If the lesson is pay more attention to local traditions, that's something else. All of this stuff is valuable in its own way if we learn from it. Well, and that was but, the thrust of the reason why um, these all these interviews actually were behind a report that Congress ordered. And so they spent a few million dollars and, and investigated, did all these interviews, wrote this report, but a lot of information was redacted from that report or not included in that report. And the report was really kind of a, 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 a sort of... I don't know the right word for it, but it's kind of the report that it's bureaucrats, it's what bureaucrats write for bureaucrats to, to, to an analyze uh, the shortcomings and to, to plan better for the future. Um, and, 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 and Bill, frankly, and also, when I heard on. about this report and the idea of doing it, I thought, well, good. It's good to see that our government is at least being analytical about something that it is engaged in right now. But I wonder whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to say, okay, now let's take all the text from all of those interviews that we did and just release those to the public and then let a bunch of, you know, essentially crowdsource the interpretation of it. Well, let me tell you another issue I have here. 
you've got a, a bunch of, of military leaders saying that this is why things weren't working and that's why it couldn't work and therefore the whole thing was a mistake. That's the Whether that is the conclusion that the report draws, that's certainly the conclusion that the Washington Post wants to leave you with. So put that aside for a minute because that's fairly obvious to me. It's in the lead. So my question now is, were there papers from leading military officials and politicians who said that it could work? Were there papers, were there opinions from people who constantly said, if we just did this, we'd be in good shape? In other words, you you want to talk about um, counting the hits and, and, and not counting the, the misses. It's like, okay, so you have now made a case that there's a significant number of people, and I'm saying this is likely, I'm not saying that this is, that this is an inversion of the actual truth, but what I am saying is you have to look at the methodology of all this stuff. So they said that there's a, a long history of, of high level people who said that this thing is, is really a miserable failure and we're, and we're doing everything wrong. What I wanna know is what people said that we're doing things right, what people had a chance to try out things that they thought were doing right. Creighton Abrams had a plan to put US armor, didn't need another reinforcement, just run it right up the Ho Chi Minh Pale Trail, stop in, in, in downtown Hanoi and dictate peace terms. Now, whether or not that would have worked, we don't know, but I think we do have to have at least an acknowledgement that a plan like that was in place, and then we can adjust the, our, our views on whether that plan was workable or not, seems workable to me, but this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. When you talk about Vietnam, I'm gonna use that because it's a little bit clearer, a little bit, a little bit further away. You talk about Vietnam as a, as a quagmire and, and unwinnable, and it was a quagmire and it was unwinnable, not because it was a quagmire and unwinnable. It was a quagmire and an unwinnable situation because the people in charge of prosecuting the war thought of it that way and they were neither in nor out. It was neither a quagmire nor unwinnable, but what in terms of military uh, activity, but it was apparently given the, the state of, of the country and the country's politicians. Even after the war was over in Vietnam, 11 years of this horror and bloodshed and, and wastage, we're playing attrition warfare for seven, eight years with, with an Asian army. Nevertheless, after all of this is done, if the reason that the war began was because North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam, when the war finished, when we were done with it, North Vietnam was behind that same line. If, you're, if your entire purpose of the war is to turn back this invasion, that's a win. Then after that was set up, we wait two years and then the Democrats pull all of the planks necessary in order to keep it there. It's like saying that after World War II, we kept troops in Germany until about 1946, 47. And at the time of the Berlin war, uh, airlift, somewhere in there, we just decided to say, oh, to hell with it. No, there's no way we can win this thing, pack up. And then we wonder why all of, all of uh, Eastern Europe remained communist this whole time. So. All I'm saying is this, number one, I think there are many, many lessons that can be learned from this and that our military ought to learn them. And if the lesson is you cannot trust the politicians to maintain a victory after it's been gotten, then that's the lesson. Well, and that does um, seem, Bill, like to be the thrust of this by just calling it the Afghanistan Papers, because the, the New York Times publication of the so-called Pentagon Papers uh, right. in the early 1970s sent the message, uh, in essence, that because politicians will lie to you about progress in war to protect their own skins, therefore, America should never go to war because we can't trust that these politicians aren't lying to us. Another way to look at that is a group of extremely left-wing politicians were on the side of the communists. I mean, there's no question, there's no question that, that Jane Fonda was on the side of the communists just as one person among millions in the country who had that opinion, but she wasn't right about it. And she used her influence to, to change, to try and change the, the, the perception of the situation in terms of what the American people thought. And she was as wrong as you could be. She was polar opposite of right. She was 100% wrong. I think Lyndon wrong. Johnson had a little more to do with how the course of the war went than Jane Fonda did. But my point is, is that the press and, and, and the left has constantly, constantly, constantly taken a position and made an announcement about a military option or a lack of a, of a possible military option as if it is inevitable truth because they say so. And I'm telling you that if these same people had been, had been in the movie theaters business and it had been in the, in the, in the news business in 1941, we would be speaking Japanese now. There's no question about it. There, this, this is not something, this is, when I heard unwinnable, I said to myself, okay, how can a newspaper make that assertion? 
How can they say that? Now, if, if it turned out again that top generals over the course of 18 years said, this is unwinnable, we can't win this, we can't win this, it's unwinnable, then that's a different story. But that's not what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is we can't get this done because of this. We can't get this done because of that. There's, we should have gone more after the corruption and stuff. And this is the reason I'm fighting so hard on this. Not to say that it was a good idea and certainly not to say that we did everything just right. But what I am saying is that this coloring of ideas, this coloring of, of Americans' military commitments is ongoing. It's been ongoing since 1946 and before that even. And, and this constant, absolute assertion that nothing can be won is, is contraindicated by the status of Germany and Japan. And it makes you wonder what, how it makes you wonder if Vietnam would not have come into the capitalist society that it is today, 30 years earlier, and 10 million people more alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful for the members at BillWhittle.com who make this programming possible. Um, we also want to thank our friends over at Patreon. Uh, we've had a hearty band of people over there who've been making contributions uh, for several years now. And the Lost if, Colony. if you're not a member at BillWhittle.com, but you'd like to be able to to help in some way, you can make a one-time contribution at patreon.com slash Bill Whittle. We'll put the link in the description below. Um, or you can make a, a recurring contribution of, say, five, $5 a month, um, however you'd like to do that. Uh, but we're, we are grateful for everybody who has come together to make this enterprise possible, to advance these ideas around the world, and frankly, to share a lot of our content. And that audience is growing on Amazon's Fire TV, um, on our podcast. You can even ask Alexa to play Bill Whittle Network on TuneIn Radio, and you can get to hear our latest show that way. So uh, lots of ways to enjoy this kind of conversation, and uh, only one way really to make it happen, and that is by becoming a member at BillWhittle.com, by contributing either there or at Patreon. Um, you're the one who makes this happen, and we're grateful for it. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members for making it possible.